Most of us enjoy taking photos of our friends, family, and surroundings when we're on vacation, spending time outdoors, or attending important ceremonies like weddings. But some photos look normal until you look a little closer to find that there's something hidden in the picture that no one saw at the time, or that it has a far more disturbing backstory than anyone expected. Number 5. Tsunamis are some of the most destructive forces of nature, as they're known to destroy anything in their path in a matter of mere seconds. In many cases where tsunamis hit built-up areas, buildings have been destroyed, vehicles have been carried off as if they're nothing more than tender, and roads have been left virtually unrecognizable. A magnitude 9.0 tsunami that hit Japan in March of 2011 proved no different when it caused widespread destruction after an earthquake occurred about 90 miles from the coast and around 19 miles beneath the sea floor. The tsunami had some unexpected consequences, as the Fukushima nuclear power plant's backup generators were damaged by the force of the tsunami waves, resulting in one of the worst nuclear disasters on record to date. This image of a ship at sea may seem normal, but quite unbelievably, it's also the result of that very same tsunami though to most people it seems almost tranquil, as if a smokestack ship is quietly making its way across the ocean towards its intended destination. But the reality of this photo is far more unnerving when it's revealed that this ship, the Ryo Unmaru, was moored at Hokkaido in Japan when the tsunami struck, dislodging it and sending it floating aimlessly out to sea with a further 1.5 million tons of debris from the shore. Luckily, no one was aboard the ship at the time, as it was slated to be sent for scrapping by its owner, who, when contacted after the ship was located, stated that he didn't want it back, leaving authorities with a difficult decision to make as to what was to become of the vessel, which had now become known as the Tsunami Ghost Ship. At first, it was thought that the best course of action would be to destroy the ship, as it was found to contain no cargo, but it was carrying 2,300 gallons of diesel fuel, which may have been a threat to marine life if it were to leak into the water. This prompted the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the EPA to carry out a threat assessment of the situation, and it was found that it would be better for the ship to be destroyed and for the diesel to be allowed to evaporate naturally. And so, the US Coast Guard readied itself for the destruction of the ship, and one of its vessels, the Anna Kappa, made its way to the area after the ship had been aimlessly drifting across the Pacific Ocean for more than a year after the tsunami struck. But their plans were interrupted when they were informed that the Bernice Sea, a 62-foot Canadian fishing vessel, had claimed salvage rights over the Rayo Unmaru, and the operation was immediately halted. The captain of the Bernice Sea and his crew assessed the condition of the ship and found that it would be unsafe to tow it away from the area, deciding instead that the Coast Guard should go ahead with their plans to destroy it, since it was drifting towards a busy shipping lane and could have posed a serious threat if it ended up in the path of a passing ship. The Coast Guard saw this as a good opportunity for crew members aboard the Anacapa to carry out a live fire exercise, and on the 5th of April 2012, they opened fire on the unmanned vessel, with more than 100 rounds being fired. While the operation was ongoing, a C-130 Hercules plane kept watch from the skies above warning any approaching ships in the area to stay clear for their own safety, and those of their passengers. After the ship was fired upon and filled with holes, the Anacapa's crew proceeded to use hoses to fill the ship with water, putting out any fires that resulted from the operation, and speeding up the rate at which it was sinking. When the operation was completed, the Rayo Unmaru disappeared beneath the waters of the Gulf of Alaska, and all that remained was a large column of smoke that trailed away over the ocean. As for the rest of the debris that was washed out into the ocean by the tsunami, it started washing up onto the shores of the western United States in 2012, much earlier than was predicted by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Number 4 This image of a bell depicts an image very similar to those of other bells found on shipwrecks, but this bell was once aboard a ship called the Wida Galley which has an interesting and somewhat sordid history. Even after it eventually sank, the ship became the stuff of legends as it was rumored to be carrying a massive haul of treasure, 
But no one knew exactly where it sank, and speculation began to run rife. The 100-foot-long Wida Galley was originally intended to be used as a slave ship when it was constructed in 1715. But this was thankfully never to be, as it never made it to its intended destination during its maiden voyage. Soon after setting out from Jamaica, the ship was set upon by a pirate known as Samuel Bellamy, also known as Black Sam, whose crew took control of the vessel and put it to good use, pirating several other ships as they made their way to Wellfleet, Massachusetts. The ship was now rumored to be loaded with the treasures that were plundered from other ships, and upon making landfall, the crew and captain would share in the spoils, making them very rich men indeed. But that's when tragedy struck. On the 26th of April in 1717, the ship had hailed within visual distance of the shore and was likely getting ready to approach. But the crew had been drinking heavily and found themselves struggling to steer the vessel against the strong winds that were reaching up to 70 miles per hour. This resulted in swells as high as 30 feet that battered the side of the ship, further hampering any efforts to take it back under control. The ship would finally strike a sandbank, causing it to rupture and sink beneath the violent waters. As soon as news of the wreck began to spread, it became clear that the treasure was up for grabs to whoever dared to enter the water, and many people started making their way to the area in hopes that they could collect their share. Colonial Governor Samuel Shute ordered a cartographer and colonial naval commander by the name of Cyprian Southack to locate the ship's wreckage and to collect as much of the sunken treasure as he could so that it could be taken back to England. Upon reaching the area, Southack reported that as many as 200 people had gathered over a 20-mile stretch of the shore to collect as much of the treasure that had washed ashore as possible after the ship had flipped over in the water and he was only able to collect a small amount of valuables. Not everyone was convinced that the ship really contained anything of value, but one of the crew members stated that 180 bags of gold and silver, 20 tons of ivory, and a large amount of jewels had been taken from other ships and were still aboard the Wida Galley after it had been divided up equally amongst its pirate crew. But the ship itself was lost beneath the water, and for the next 250 years or so, many treasure hunters searched for it and speculated where it could be located, but without any success. That's until 1984, when a treasure hunter named Barry Clifford believed that he had finally found the ship's wreckage off the coast of Cape Cod. Clifford had heard about the sunken treasure when he was a child growing up in Cape Cod, and had always dreamed of finding it one day. Upon locating the wreck of the ship, he was still uncertain that it was the Wida Galley, but he and his crew soon started finding coins and gold that dated to the correct time period, and he started to believe that he'd finally found what he was looking for. But his suspicions were only confirmed when the ship's bell was found, and upon closer inspection, they noticed an inscription that read the Wida Galley 1716, confirming that they had indeed solved the mystery of the ship's location and that it wasn't a mere legend. Along with the gold and silver that was found, Clifford's crew also salvaged thousands of other artifacts from the wreckage, many of which were now housed at the expedition Wida Sea Lab and Learning Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts. They were also fortunate enough to find more than 20 cannons that were taken by Bellamy from plundered ships during his reign of terror on the open sea, and it's expected that more artifacts will be uncovered as more treasures are found with each expedition to the wreckage. To this day, the Wida Galley remains the only authenticated pirate shipwreck that's ever been recovered, and its legend is set to live on for many years to come. Number 3 Any fan of the author Mark Twain will be familiar with his most famous character Tom Sawyer, a boy who loves nothing more than spending time outside rather than attending his classes at school. They'll also remember that Tom and his companions often visited a swimming hole where they kept the sweltering Missouri heat at bay. And while many of us may have done the same thing when we were younger, it's an activity that's frowned upon today since it's considered to be too dangerous. But one swimming hole seems to have a worse reputation than most, as it seems quite harmless at the surface, as is evidenced in this image. But it hides a terrifying secret beneath the water. The Jacob's Well Spring is now known as one of the most dangerous diving sites in the world, 
but this hasn't stopped people from flocking to its cool waters during the hotter days of summer in Texas. There are those who are more cautious, though, and they vowed never to set foot in the well's water, since it's claimed the lives of at least eight divers who have attempted to explore the cave system that lies beneath. Attempts were then made in 1980 to discourage divers from exploring the caves as a rebar grate was affixed to the entrance, further bolstered by quickset concrete, but quite unbelievably it did little to deter divers who were determined to make it into the depths of the caves. Just six months after these modifications were made, the grate was found to have been removed by divers who had the forethought to carry tools with them as they made their way to the cave's entrance. These divers went as far as to leave a note next to the dismantled grate that read, you can't keep us out, and it became clear that very little could be done to keep people from risking their lives in search of a thrill. Many divers have ventured into the cave system's first chamber, which is the least dangerous, since it reaches 30 feet straight down before angling away for a further 55 feet, making it relatively easy to navigate and to return to the surface. But this is where the caves become much more dangerous, and the fact that the second chamber is referred to as a funnel should be enough to discourage anyone from venturing inside, but this simply isn't the case. The funnel stretches around 80 feet into the distance before ending in an area with restricted access that leads to the third chamber. But what makes it even more terrifying is the fact that it contains a false chimney, which has been mistaken by many divers as a way to the surface only to find out that they were very wrong and at least one diver has become trapped in this area. This would be enough to keep most divers out of the cave system, but many have ventured beyond this point to the terrifying third chamber, which contains silt and unsteady gravel that poses a serious threat to any diver. If a diver were to make it this far, they would need to make use of inflatable water wings as they need to avoid stirring up any dust or silt that can seriously hamper their vision and navigation two of the most important aspects of diving. Only a few divers have ventured beyond this point, as those who dare to attempt entry into the fourth chamber first have to do something that may seem like pure insanity to the casual observer, which is the removal of their oxygen tanks. This needs to be done because the entrance is too narrow for a diver to swim through while the tanks are strapped to their back. Those who have made it inside and back to the surface have stated that the chamber is free of silt and filled with beautiful limestone formations. On one occasion, a 21-year-old diver named Diego Adame decided to explore the caves but soon found that he was running out of oxygen after losing one of his flippers, and he realized that he only had a slim chance of making it out in time. He then decided that his only option was to use his blade to cut himself free of his weight belt, and thankfully he was able to make it back to dry land in the nick of time but he later described his experience as death-defied. Jacob's Well is infamous for the dangers that it holds, but despite this, many people still decide to swim and dive there, ignoring the warning signs that encourage them not to. Number 2 When discussing Western movies, one of the most iconic films that's usually mentioned is Tombstone, which contains some of the greatest characters from Days Gone. In reality, the town of Tombstone, which is located in Arizona, is rumored to be one of the most haunted places in the Old West, and it's thought that many of the spirits that dwell there are those of people who lost their lives to outlaws, disease, and general lawlessness. One of its most haunted attractions is the Birdcage Theater, which back in the day served not only as a theater but as a saloon, gambling area, and brothel. It's said that as many as 26 people lost their lives in the theater for various reasons, and many visitors have reported seeing the spirits of the deceased still roaming around the building. Some claim to have heard disembodied laughter, smelled phantom cigarette smoke, and even heard the sound of a piano playing in the same way that it would have been done in the days of the Old West. Apparitions have been seen in the area that are described as wearing clothing dating back to the 1800s confirming in many people's minds that these are indeed the ghosts of people who lived in the area during that time. There are also rumors that Fremont Street, which is located close to the OK Corral, is haunted thanks to a battle that was fought between Virgil, Wyatt, and Morgan Earp, along with Doc Holliday against a set of outlaws that was made up of Billy Claiborne, Wes Fuller, Ike and Billy Clanton, as well as the McClary brothers Frank and Tom. Many people have reported seeing the spirit of a man named James Burnett, 
who was also known as Justice Jem, thanks to his position of Justice of the Peace in Pierce, Arizona, walking in the area of the OK Corral. They believe it to be Jim's ghost since he lost his life there during a shootout. Shefalin Hall served as a theater and opera house back in the day, and it's yet another tombstone building that's said to contain the spirits of people who perished there. Some people have reported hearing the sound of chains being dragged across the building's floor, while others claim to have seen a specter, believed to be that of an actress who performed in the building at one point. Much of the eerie activity that's been noticed in the building seems to be concentrated backstage, further bolstering the theory that many of these spirits belong to the actors and actresses who once performed there. There is, however, very little evidence that these hauntings are true, but this can't be said for another site in Tombstone that's said to contain spirits, namely the Boot Hill Cemetery, where this photo was taken in 1996. The image seems innocent enough, as it shows a man dressed up like a cowboy, posing for the camera while brandishing a firearm. He's looking directly at the camera with a sullen expression on his face, but it's what can be seen behind him that has left many people baffled and terrified to visit the area. A short distance away in the background, the image of another man can be seen, but strangely only the top part of his body is visible, leading many people to believe that this is a ghost that was caught on camera as it appeared behind the man in the foreground. The photo was taken by Ike Clanton, who has repeatedly stated that there was no one else in the area when he took the photo of one of his friends. No one noticed the strange figure in the background until Ike's friend took a closer look at it about two weeks later, and he immediately called Ike to explain what he had found. The man in the background looks like he's wearing a flat-brimmed hat with a light-colored shirt, but Ike insists that he wasn't visible at the time the photo was taken. Ike noticed that the apparition seemed to be looking in the direction of Clanton and the McLaurie brothers' graves, and many people believe that he may have been someone who was involved in the shootout that took place at Fremont Street. While many people believe the photo to have been manipulated, it's been scrutinized by many experts over the years and none have been able to find any evidence that it was tampered with. Others think that it isn't actually a spirit, but a mannequin that was placed there intentionally, though this hasn't been proven either, and it's generally accepted in the area that this is the apparition of a long-forgotten cowboy who still walks around the cemetery, even during the day. Number 1 There have been many instances where people unwittingly capture what they believe to be a ghost on camera. And strangely, many of these happened while a picture was being taken of someone sitting in some form of transport. One such example comes from a photo taken in England in 1959 by a woman named Mabel Chenery. At the time, Mabel's husband was sitting in the driver's seat of his car when she decided to snap a picture of him. But when the film was developed and she took a closer look, she was shocked to see the image of her mother sitting in the back seat. What makes the image even creepier is the fact that the couple had just visited Mabel's mother's grave, and she believes that her mother may have wanted to go on one last car journey in the seat that she used to sit in while she was alive. The photo was analyzed by an expert, who at first thought it may merely be a reflection in the car's window, or that it may be a case of double exposure. But he soon stated that he would stake his reputation that the photo wasn't faked in any way. There is always the possibility that the photo was merely a hoax, or that the ghostly figure was indeed caused by some sort of reflection, but none of these theories have been proven, and many people have accepted that it does in fact show a spirit sitting in the car's back seat. In 2018, a 15-year-old boy named Troy Vance decided to grab his camera when he noticed a particularly beautiful sunrise, and while doing so, he decided to include a truck in the picture since he liked the way it looked against the sunrise. He then uploaded the photo to Facebook, but was surprised when some of his friends started commenting that there was something ominous hiding in the photo, and he decided to take a closer look. As he zoomed in, he saw what everyone was talking about, the ghostly apparition of a young boy sitting inside the truck. Troy confirmed that there was no one in the truck at the moment that he took the photo, and is convinced that he managed to capture a spirit on camera. But one of the more convincing instances of a spirit being photographed inside a vehicle is this image that was taken in 1987 by a woman known as Mrs. Sayer while she was visiting the Fleet Air Arm Museum at the Royal Navy Air Station in England. 
At one point during this visit, Mrs. Sayer decided to have her photo taken in the cockpit of a helicopter that was being used during the Falkland War, but was then obviously no longer in any condition to be flown. She climbed aboard on her own and asked a friend to take the photo, but when the film was developed, she inspected it closely and realized there was someone in the cockpit with her, though this should have been impossible since she was certain that the helicopter was empty at the time. At first, she thought that it may be a case of double exposure, but the more she looked at the photo, the more convinced she became that it was the image of a man sitting next to her, rather than her own. Many people who have inspected the photo state that they can see a man wearing a white collared shirt and what's taken most people by surprise is the remarkable clarity of the alleged apparition. The man also seems to be looking over at Mrs. Sayer, or possibly at the person taking the photo, leading many people to believe that the spirit was fully aware that a photo was being taken, suggesting a slight mischievous personality. What makes the photo even stranger is the fact that there have been no reported hauntings at the Fleet Air Arm Museum, and that the helicopter was never flown by anyone who lost their lives while at the helm. There have been suggestions that the spirit belonged to a pilot who passed away long after the war ended, and that he likes to visit the museum from time to time. But not everyone is convinced, and many skeptics have pointed out that there's no definitive way to prove that the image isn't actually a reflection, or that there wasn't someone sitting next to Mrs. Sayer when the photo was taken. To those who believe, though, it's a ghostly mystery that continues to baffle the mind 36 years later. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.